Good morning, uh, everybody, and first of all, thank you uh, to the organizers for inviting me for this uh, meeting. It's the second time I'm invited in uh, one of these uh, meetings uh, co-organized with the uh, Canadian Center for Advanced Studies. Um, the previous one was very interesting. Um, uh, my, I have been asked to present this keynote lecture and, uh, and the, the title that was proposed by some of the organizers was the, the Down of Anthropocene. And I've been wondering what I wanted to put in this keynote lecture that in my view should be a bit aside of the topic but connected to the topic. And uh, I would like to uh, explore uh, this question of Anthropocene um, in the perspective of not so much of what is the story of human evolution for the last 300,000 years or more, but more on the notion of how humans um, modify their environments. Because at the end, uh, human evolution is uh, mostly a niche construction, is one species that has been able to shape its environment like many others, but to a scale that is, uh, has no precedent in uh, life history. And the very notion of uh, Anthropocene, it's an old notion. In fact, the term has been used along the, the 20th century. Um, some uh, anthropologists and geologists in, in the in former Soviet Union use the term of Anthropocene to speak about the, what we call today the, the Pleistocene or the Quaternary, because in their view, that was the, uh, the epoch of human evolution and deserved this term of Anthropocene. So the term has been used with different meanings, but most recently, it became very popular um, and uh, mostly was promoted by a, a chemist called uh, Paul Crutzen, was interested in the chemistry of atmosphere, and uh, he regarded the influence of recent human behavior on Earth's atmosphere as so significant, uh, has to constitute a new geological epoch. And since this proposal, there has been a lot of discussion about what is the Anthropocene and when it should start. So uh, geologists used to divide time by uh, eras, uh, systems, or periods, uh, and smaller divisions that we called uh, epochs, like for example, the, the Pleistocene I was, I was talking about, and then there are subdivisions. Um, we are now in the end of an era that is the Cenozoic, and uh, in the Cenozoic there is a, uh, a system that we call the Quaternary, Within uh, the Quaternary, there is a long epoch that is the Pleistocene. The Pleistocene is the, uh, the epoch when most of the evolution of the genus Homo uh, took place. It lasted uh, 2.6 million years. And at the very end of the Pleistocene, there is this very small division that we call the Holocene. <clears throat> and the Holocene is barely more than 11,000 years. And already when the Holocene was created, there was a lot of discussion about geologists about the, the validity of creating such a short uh, a division in regard of all the other epochs of the geological time that for, are always uh, of a length in, in million years. Uh, and in fact, already at the time when the Holocene was created, one of the main reasons why it was created is because it was the end of the last glacial event on Earth, and basically is the period when a, um, a more temperate climate established itself and allowed the development of agriculture and many human activities. But as you see in this curve here, this period, this warmer period, this is a, a, a curve showing you, let's put it this way, climatic variation on Earth. It's a bit more complicated than that. It's, in fact, it's the volume of, of Earth on the continent. And you see a succession of glacial and interglacial periods, many, many in the past, 
And uh, we are now in, the, in one of these uh, interglacial. Uh, within this interglacial, recently, the impact of humans on, of, on environments increased even more. And you can see that on this uh, core that has been drilled in a, in a lake in the, in the west of Greenland. And what you see here is a deposit through time with sediments which are uh, mostly resulting from the glacial activity in the environment. And recently, uh, a big change with a lot of organic sediments coming and a, a, a clear change in the, in the nature of the sediment. And this clear change is primarily related to the uh, global warming we are uh, facing. So it's not the Holocene, it's something else that comes at the end of the Holocene, is that an increase in the, in the uh, climatic change uh, during the interglacial. This is a zoom in the curve you already saw. Uh, this climatic fluctuation through time in the last million years are primarily uh, due to changes in the um, uh, parameters of the Earth's orbit around the Sun. But these variations are not enough to explain the amount of uh, temperature change that we see on Earth. In fact, we think that this variation, these astron astronomical parameters, have an influence on the, uh, the amount of solar energy received in the middle latitude, especially in the northern atmosphere, and that this trigger, in fact, these changes. But the main mechanism of climatic change uh, through glacial and interglacial uh, cycles is the variation of uh, greenhouse uh, gas in the, in the atmosphere. Basically, what happens is that when there is a minimal increase of the temperature of the surface of the oceans, especially in the southern hemisphere where the oceans are very developed, um, this um, creates a, a production of... Uh, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that is dissolved in the, in the ocean. And in this production of uh, greenhouse uh, gas that uh, created the, the glacial uh, cycles. And what you see here is that recently, the increase of uh, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere increased dramatically, not because of this astronomical forcing, but because the, of the human activities. And you see that the, the amount of uh, CO2 uh, in the atmosphere in this interglacial has nothing to do, nothing to see with what was um, uh, present in the, in the past, in the course of the last million years. Basically, we return uh, to a, uh, an amount of CO2 in the atmosphere that existed in the, in the Miocene, uh, when Europe was covered by tropical forest. No. And if we don't do anything, this is our future. Okay. Uh, beside these climatic changes, we have a number of other changes in the environment, and many of these changes uh, took place around what has been called the Great Acceleration, and the Great Acceleration basically is the years 19. 50, something like that. So there is an increase in the production on the surface of Earth because of human activities of aluminum, of concrete, of plastic, also of uh, charcoal particles. And all these things are found uh, not just in the industrial statistics, but you can find them also in the deposits of flakes, in the sediments of sea, and in the environment in general. Same thing for the production of uh, nitrogen fertilizers. And all this created a major uh, change of the environment, again, that you can perceive in the, in the sediments of uh, lakes, for example. So uh, the discussion about um, the, the Anthropocene and when, if this uh, geological division is created, 
the discussion about the when, uh, the question of when the, uh, the, this, this division should start, um, receive a, a, I would say, a, a, a main support for the year 1950. But there are many people who argue that, in fact, these changes started much earlier, maybe in the 18th century, uh, with the start of the Industrial Revolution, or even uh, further back in time. And what I would like to argue today is that uh, <clears throat> we may go even much further back in time. And uh, I would like to uh, show you how our species uh, changed the environment uh, in a way uh, that started very slowly but has a major uh, impact uh, already for tens of thousands of uh, years. Uh, beside all these changes in the climate and in the um, atmospheric composition, in the uh, also uh, all the uh, effects that we see in the sedimentation in lakes and in the in oceans, uh, there is of course a major impact on the fauna, and you all know already how many uh, the large number of vertebrates that are disappearing, so many species has been disappearing in the last couple of centuries. So already, we don't speak just of the period between 1950 and now, but we go much further back in time. Uh, <clears throat> and by the way, uh, what concerns many ecologists today is not just the extinction of many species, but is the, the fact that the number of individuals per species is reducing in, even in a more dramatic, uh, uh, at an even more dramatic rate. If we go further back in time, let's say 10,000 years ago or 11,000 years ago, we see already a major change in terms of the um, composition of the vertebrate biomass on the continents. What has been going on is that constantly in the last 10,000 years, uh, the biomass of vertebrates on the continent has been increasingly composed by the humans themselves and by their domestic animals. So we're starting uh, about 10,000 years ago uh, with a situation where the, the wild animals on the continent represented more than 98% of the biomass to a situation where today it's just the reverse, is 97 or more than 97% of the biomass on the continent is made of humans or their domestic animals. And I'm sure that uh, you know that this has a uh, strong uh, uh, impact on the question of the uh, interaction between humans and the microbial. Uh, environment. Uh, some people have argued that, in fact, this development of the domestication of animals and the development of agriculture, in fact, already in the past, triggered a climatic change and uh, already an incipient global warming that would be much older than the, the one that we observed in the past century. Uh, it's mostly uh, a scholar called Rudiman that has been arguing that already for about 10, uh, 10 years. And the argument by Rudiman is that if you look at the rate of uh, methane and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and how it changed through time, you see something really unusual in the last 10,000 years. Uh, what you have on this chart in blue is the average of what has been measured for the change of this, uh, the rate of these two gases in the atmosphere uh, for the previous interglacials. So it's a, it's, a, it's a mean of, I mean, it's the pattern that we should expect. So during the, an interglacial, there is a decrease of uh, this, the, the, the amount of these two gases in the atmosphere. And eventually, when this rate becomes very low, this is the start for a new glacial period. 
what is going on in, in our interglacial, and these are the, the, the red spots, is that surprisingly, in this interglacial, uh, there is an inc after a decrease, there is an increase, especially of methane, uh, of, um, of in the atmosphere. And this increase started, you see the numbers are around five to 6,000 years ago. And this is the time when agriculture started to develop on Earth. And what Rudiman has been arguing for a long time already is that is the development of uh, domestication, the, the development of, um, of, of livestock in tropical areas for the last several thousand years that created this production of methane starting 7,000 years ago, that also the production of uh, rice, cultivation of rice in Southeast Asia, and production of rice implies a strong modification of the environment to create sort of ponds to, to produce your rice, that this also can be directly related to the, the increase of um, the amount of uh, methane in the atmosphere. And ultimately, that the development of, of agriculture in, in different parts of the world led to the destruction of many forested uh, surfaces in, in Eurasia and in other places on the planet, and that this is the reason why we already have an incipient but already present uh, climatic change that existed uh, not just for the uh, couple of decades but for thousands of years. Uh, beyond this idea, there is also the notion that basically humans, uh, and this is, I would say, the positive side of these changes, by, by developing agriculture, created the condition for agriculture to be possible. Because in previous interglacial, we know that we have short, uh, brief, catastrophic climatic events that did not happen uh, during the last interglacial, during the, the Holocene, probably maybe because of the presence of this uh, greenhouse um, uh, effect in, in the atmosphere already. So the, the works by Rudiman has been uh, very, uh, criticized by uh, geologists, climatologists, um, uh, especially regarding the, the variation of CO2. But, but recently, in 2013, there was a paper published in Science by a group of authors with uh, Mitchell as first author. And, and this study was a comparison of the variation of the methane budget uh, in the atmosphere in the last 10,000 years, comparing data from Antarctica and Greenland, from ice cores taken in these two areas. And by comparing that, it has been possible to check what are the parameters that influence this variation in, uh, in, in methane rate in the two geographical areas, taking into account human uh, activities and also uh, natural uh, parameters. And from this study, it's clear that, uh, at least for methane, there is an effect of human activities in these changes. And this study uh, brought a very strong support to the, the models by uh, the model developed by, by Rudiman. So uh, Rudiman and others has been struggling for now about 10 years uh, about this notion that Anthropocene should start either uh, let's say, in the late 20th century with the development of uh, bomb, atomic bomb tests and many other changes on the planet. And at the, the other extreme of the, of the spectra, uh, there are people who uh, would basically argue that we don't, don't need to create uh, Anthropocene division because we already have the Holocene and the Anthropocene is just an acceleration of the... Um, of the Holocene, and that also the, the problem is that uh, all these changes have a dichronous character, and that's very difficult to uh, decide on a single instant uh, or, st or date for the start of this phenomenon. So what I would like to, to show you now in the second part of my talk is that, in fact, 
Uh, even if we go further back in time, we can see already an impact of uh, humans on the environment. Uh, this is a, not a tree, but a sort of a mosaic of the, the many uh, groups of hominins that has been identified um, in, the, in the past uh, seven million years. Uh, there are many debates among paleoanthropologists about how uh, many species are represented uh, among all these groups and if they are real, real biological species or not. I'm not going to enter all this uh, discussion now, but I would simply like to highlight the fact that there is a very large diversity of hominins in the past and that if we go almost any time in the past, you have several groups of hominins existing on the planet and sometime in the same uh, continent. And in fact, it's a unique situation at the geological scale that today we have only one species of hominins living on Earth. In a, in a, in a previous course I, I gave here in the Collège de France, I, 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 I gave to my old season, of course, the title of the orphan species, because we, we are really orphans somehow. We have lost all our parents and uh, relatives. Uh, but um, as you'll see, we're probably a bit responsible for that. Uh, before I investigate the effect of this uh, spread of one species on the planet, I would like to start to go a little bit further back in time to tell you that if you go about 1.2 million years ago, there was already something that looked like what is going on now with one species that's Homo erectus, that is the first species that spread out of Africa and colonized part of Eurasia. And there was a moment when uh, this species was probably almost alone on Earth. I say almost because recently we have found in Africa a small hominins that we call Homo naledi that looks like a, a sort of... Um, Okapi of hominins that survive in one corner of Africa. So it's almost. But the fact is that uh, this period is the end of all these uh, uh, Australopith and other uh, early Homo and the spread of this Homo erectus. And what's going on at this time? What's going on is that we have a major change in the behavior of hominins. And we are shifting from hominins who have a omnivorous but mostly vegetarian diet to hominins that have a uh, omnivorous but mostly carnivorous diet. And we see that in many ways. Uh, in Africa, between 2 and 1.8 million years ago, we see the multiplication of sites where we find a lot of a stone artifacts that has been used to butcher animals, and we find a lot of bones of this animal that has been crushed and cut. Mesdames, Messieurs, votre attention, s'il vous plaît, à la suite d'un incident technique. Yes, I knew it was a difficult topic, but yes. <laughs> we, gave up on, we gave up on a more uh, a vegetal food diet and uh, started to have a more carnivorous diet. And this is uh, exemplified by these archaeological sites that we have in Africa, uh, mostly starting 1.8 million years ago. Uh, this is a, a major issue for hominin because it has a number of implications uh, in terms of uh, the way uh, hominins extracted energy from the environment and the way they have been able to allocate or reallocate energy to different parts of their uh, organism and especially um, to the brain. And this was conducted to, through uh, development of hunting, of course, but also most likely initially by uh, scavenging. And this scavenging basically um, set the hominins in a situation of direct competition with carnivores and especially la uh, large uh, carnivores. A topic that may interest you is that if you look at the molecular phylogeny of some uh, human parasites, especially intestinal worms, uh, you can connect different groups of humans, uh, population, etc. If you go further back in time, 
uh, you are going to have um, a branching of uh, intest uh, lineages of intestinal parasites of large cats uh, that are directly connected to those that we find in hominin. And this probably indicates this kind of proximity and competition around uh, the available sources of, of meat. And this already is going to have an impact on the environment and especially on the fauna. And we tend today to see Africa as the, the paradise for large carnivores like uh, lions and uh, leopards and cheetahs and hyenas, etc. But this is a very impoverished fauna compared to what existed in the past. If we move back in time two or three million years ago, we have a much richer fauna of carnivores in Africa with all sorts of animals that you would not like to meet today. Uh, these sabertooth cats, different genus, different species, a whole diversity of these animals, uh, giant hyenas about this size uh, that uh, were around together with uh, genus and species that still exist today. Uh, and things even that we have difficulties imagining in Africa, but for example, this large running um, uh, bear uh, that existed in the environment. And many of these animals disappeared between two and 1.5 million years ago. And this has been uh, especially investigated by a Swedish colleague called uh, Verdelin that basically shows that uh, there is a major break at the time when hominins passed onto this uh, more carnivorous diet. And the explanation for this extinction is difficult to find in the environment. Because if we look, for example, at the diversity of small carnivores in this period of time, there is an increase of the diversity there's also an increase in the diversity of other mammals in Africa during this time period. And the only group where we see a major drop of the number of species is these large carnivores. And it's most likely because of humans that we have this uh, wave of extinction in Africa. Interestingly, animals like these sabertooth cats that we see disappearing in Africa uh, soon after two million years ago are going to persist in other parts of the world. For example, in Europe, until 300,000 years ago, you can find these animals. And of course, uh, these are areas of the world where human density was much lower for a long period of time. Uh, so of course now, uh, I, I mentioned this effect of the change in diet of hominins two million years ago. Uh, the out of Africa movement of our own species more recently had a much uh, more uh, dramatic effect on the environment. Uh, we have the first representatives of our species uh, in Africa, in Northwest Africa, 300,000 years ago. And we think that by this time, there was already Homo sapiens all over the place in Africa. There are even uh, indication that uh, they made small air excursions already in Southwest Asia. Uh, all these lines are uh, mitochondrial lineages that are represented dispersing on Earth. I removed the dates because the dates have been changing a lot <laughs> recently. Um, but uh, there is some indication that there is already an integration of mitochondrial DNA of African origins in the Neanderthal lineage around 300,000 years ago. Um, especially during episode that we call Green Sahara episode when Sahara, but also Arabia, were covered by uh, savannas and, and grasslands. We suspect that the African hominins, Homo sapiens, expanded in this part of the world. And certainly, South Asia is the first place where our species expanded out of Africa and Arabia and probably already replaced archaic forms of hominins. We have traces of Homo sapiens in, in the Far East at least 70,000 years ago, and probably even before, maybe 80,000. And soon after, we have hominins entering Australia, possibly uh, 60,000 years ago. 
And lately, they entered into the higher latitudes. So in Europe, we have the final replacement of uh, Neanderthals about 40,000 years ago. Uh, we have humans living in uh, close to the Arctic Circle in uh, northern Siberia 30,000 years ago. They entered Alaska maybe 25,000 years ago, and much more recently uh, developed into the rest of uh, Americas. And this expansion of our uh, species had two effects. First of all, the absorption or extinction of all the other hominins existing on Earth and leading to the situation that I showed you where there is only one species, and also a major impact on the fauna. Um, there have been a lot of discussions about the effect of uh, humans on uh, the extinction of large mammals. In this period between, say, 130,000, where we start to have homo sapiens just out of Africa in, in Arabia and Southwest Asia and the beginning of the Holocene, uh, and the debate basically confronts people supporting that the extinctions are mostly related to environmental changes and others that support that it's mostly humans that are responsible. And I think clearly uh, the balance is tilting on the side of the human influence. There are many arguments for that. Uh, this is a rather recent study showing the proportion of large mammals getting extinct at the surface of the Earth during this time period. And you see a clear difference between what has been going on in Africa and South Asia, and red spots like Australia, Americas, and also Europe. And the argument is that this part of the world is a part of the world where there is a long coevolution of humans with their games, with their, uh, the, the large mammals, and is the place of the world where the rate of extinction recently has been the lowest. But in the places where there was no humans at all before, this is where the uh, impact of the arrival of humans is the, the largest. And uh, the extinctions are mostly affecting uh, large mammals. Uh, what you see here is a, a recent study about the, the, the body size selectivity in terms of extinction in the course of the last 65 million years, okay? And in the, la in the course of the last 55 uh, million years, so the Cenozoic record, you see that the, this histogram is centered on zero, which means that there is no body size selectivity. Basically, all animals are susceptible to disappear through time. And the big change is during the Pleistocene, and especially the late Pleistocene and the terminal Pleistocene. And you see a, a clear shift uh, from the, uh, uh, the, the no selectivity effect, and it's clearly the largest animal that are most likely to, uh, to disappear. And we see that in, in many continents, uh, the species that are most likely to disappear during the late Pleistocene are the ones which are in the largest uh, classes of uh, body mass. There is a second group of uh, mammals which is also impacted by human uh, development, and this second group is again uh, the carnivores. And, uh, and the carnivores disappear mostly because they compete with humans or human competes with them. The large mammals, probably because they are uh, easier to uh, target and, to, uh, and, and can produce a large uh, mass of, um, of proteins and, and fat. So quickly, as I said, the three areas where we see a large uh, number of extinctions are Australia. So we have in Australia, before the arrival of humans, a large number of large marsupials so you all know the modern kangaroos, but there were much bigger kangaroos in the past, and also marsupials the size of a, a rhino and that existed in, in Australia. And all these animals are going to uh, disappear mostly after uh, 50, 40,000 years. Uh, as I mentioned already, there are uh, people who support that these extinctions are mostly related to 
uh, climatic changes, uh, a shift in the amplitude and swing of this um, uh, climatic variation in the course of the last 500,000 years, uh, arguing that maybe some of these animals, like the diprotodon, this sort of rhino-sized uh, marsupial I just showed you, got extinct before the arrival of, of humans, but recently there were uh, the discovery of very old archaeological sites in Australia, and, and there was uh, the protodon remains found. So it's clear that there is a small overlap between humans and these large animals in Australia, and that uh, they are uh, they got extinct because of humans. Um, a study showing uh, how we can try to uh, model the extinctions um, by using several scenarios in terms of timing for the colonization of uh, Americas and Australia and trying to connect this with either with climatic changes or with the timing of arrival of humans. And you see that uh, the most likely um, uh, explicative uh, scenario is the extinctions due by the arrival of, of humans. There is a similar debate about Americas, with also uh, in Americas the uh, existence of very large animals uh, just 15,000 years ago, uh, mammoth, elephants, uh, mastodons, uh, uh, all sorts of, uh, of very, very large mammals. And we have a major wave of extinction uh, between about 14 and uh, 12,000 years ago in Americas with a rate of extinction that's extremely high in this period of time. Again, there has been a discussion about the possibility that this is, so here we are, we are in a completely different window of time than Australia, uh, the possibility that this is related to this climatic change at the end of the Pleistocene, but uh, the archeological data show that within, and this comes from different studies, that in archeological sites there is a clear bias uh, in terms of uh, uh, body size uh, classes of mammals that are targeted by these uh, first Amerindians. And you see that very large animals, this class uh, five, basically elephants, is the kind of uh, mammals that these first uh, um, uh, colonizers of Americas uh, were uh, hunting. So it's most likely that it's, again, humans that uh, led all these animals to extinction. And to finish Europe, well, together with the Neanderthals, there were all sorts of, uh, I would say, animals that we even have difficulties imagining today. Like, for example, these macaques existed in glacial times in Europe. Uh, beside the Neanderthals, with the arrival of modern humans, they disappeared. Uh, same thing for the, uh, the cave bear. The cave bear appeared in, the, in Eurasia about at the same time of, than the Neanderthals, about uh, 500, 600,000 years ago. This is when the uh, split with the brown bear is uh, located in time. They co-evolved with Neanderthals for many hundred thousand years, and again with the arrival of modern humans, uh, about 10,000 years, 15,000 years after, they completely disappear. And last but not least, I would like to uh, point out a last parameter for the modification of the environment by humans, is the fire. And fire have been systematically used by humans uh, at least for the last 400,000 years and probably even before. Uh, of course, uh, fire can be produced naturally by uh, impact of uh, lightning. So this is a map showing you that, especially in uh, Africa, there is a lot of natural fire uh, related to these natural causes, much less in the, in the higher latitude, still it exists. And uh, recently, there has been a lot of interest for the, uh, the way humans use fire, not just to cook their uh, food and to produce heat and light in their dwelling, but in general, to shape the environment. Uh, and when we look at what, what is the use of fire, 
by recent hunter-gatherers, I'm not talking about uh, Pleistocene, but people living uh, a couple of generations ago, uh, and you see that there is a large number of use of fire, uh, mostly to drive animals uh, during hunting, uh, but also for, uh, for war, uh, for communication, for all sorts of reasons like that, even for fun, uh, this is one of the reasons that has been given in these interviews. So human light fires in the environment, and we see uh, this effect also in the geological record. Uh, two examples, one in Australia. This is a, uh, a lake that is in northeast Aus uh, Australia where it has been possible to drill and to study the composition of the vegetation in the environment and the presence of these micro charcoals that are produced by burning of the, the landscape. And you see that uh, around 45,000 years ago, uh, there is the development of this micro charcoal in the deposits and a dramatic change in the vegetation. And again, it's most likely the presence of humans who intentionally burn the bush uh, to make it uh, more productive for the hunting that is, re is uh, responsible for these uh, changes. A similar argument has been recently developed about Europe uh, during the last glacial maximum. It's possible uh, from all the climatic and paleoclimatic data that we have to model uh, the, the kind of vegetation that we should have had during the last glacial maximum in Europe, and to compare this modeling with what we observe in the geological record and in the archaeological sites. And uh, what we see here is that uh, the, the, the forested uh, surface, surfaces are much more reduced in the reality than what is expected. And again, it's humans who are considered to be responsible for that. So I could continue like that for a moment, but uh, to finish, I would really like to uh, emphasize the fact that uh, all these kind of changes that we, we see with um, all species moving out of Africa uh, is something that are barely seen with any other species of, of hominids. Uh, we have uh, I've shown you uh, this impact of Homo erectus hunting on the carnivores in terms of landscape and in terms also of um, uh, reduction of diversity of other species. There is nothing visible at the moment. So it's mostly uh, the, the, the expansion of Homo sapiens on the planet that is responsible for all these changes. It's something that started a long time ago started maybe more than 100,000 years ago, so we are now very far from the beginning of the Anthropocene, say, uh, 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 50 or 60 years ago. I'm so, sort of returning to this concept of Anthropocene of the old Sovietic uh, geologists who basically connected the expansion of hominins with the Anthropocene in general. Um, and, uh, and, and humans have... have a way, when I say humans, I mean modern humans, they have a way to exploit the environment with an intensity that is something that has been never uh, developed by other hominins be before. So they have a way to, I would say, to, to squeeze the lemon uh, that is, uh, has no precedent. Uh, and of course, in the uh, frame of the discussion that you have, you are going to have in the coming two days, you should keep this in mind, because I think this has a, a major impact, not just on the macrofauna that has been describing in the in the last half uh, half hour, but also on the on the microbial uh, microbiome uh, environment, and especially. Uh, since the development of agriculture and farming, uh, this modification of this environment has, have had many implications for this interaction between uh, microbes and, and humans. Thank you for your attention.